this week, as you know, we've had revival services. Herman Kramer was here. He preached us Sunday morning, Sunday night, throughout the week, Wednesday. But the thing about revival is it doesn't matter how much you come or if you um, come at all, it matters on whether or not you want to be revived. You see, you don't need revival services to experience revival. To experience revival, you have to ask God to move in your life, to, to ask God to change your heart into what He wants you to be. Everybody, every Christian, at some point, and if not at multiple points in their Christian life, needs to be revived. We need to experience revival. We need to be encouraged. We need to be changed into that which God is calling us to be. But the sad reality is many Christians throughout the United States and the world would just as soon revival didn't come into their lives because it's inconvenient. It, it will force changes in their lives that they may not want to be. It would disrupt their lives. You see, it is revival is totally disruptive. Because you and I, we get comfortable where we're at. And God comes along and says, I'm not comfortable with where you're at. So I want you to move over here where I need you to be. And it disrupts our lives. See, revival in a person's life can be inconvenient as God calls the Christian into a deeper relationship with him. And by doing so, he reveals sin in our lives. And that's unconfessed, and he calls for us to make that sin known to him and get rid of it in our lives and move away from it. True revival is in many ways almost a salvation experience. If you remember the salvation experience you had when the Holy Spirit came upon you, you confessed your sins, you got right with God, and that sense, that sense of, wow, it's, it's good. It's awesome. It's holy. It's righteous. I, this, this is incredible. Well, when we experience true revival, when our lives line up with what God is doing for us and in us, it is, it's an incredible experience. It, it moves us in ways that we cannot explain or understand. So if you were here this week, or even if you weren't, ask yourself, since I was saved, have I become a different person? And am I different from last week spiritually than I am this week? Because the Christian life is not meant to be a stagnant thing. It is meant to be ever growing, ever rolling. No moss is going to gather on this rock because this rock is Jesus Christ. Amen. And he is constantly on the go. He's constantly moving. So if you look at your life and you see no change took place in your life, you might want to ask yourself, was I revived? And if I wasn't revived, why not? Now, obviously, one of the greatest hindrances of, re of revival in anyone's life is sin. We, we all have it. And even though Christians, we are saved by grace, every Christian struggles with sin in our life. Most Christians have one or two sins that have been the habit of their life oftentimes. They just return to those sins and those are the things they pick back up and then they feel bad because they went back to this thing and they told God they were going to let go over and over and over and we struggle with this faith that we have. And these sins make this struggle even harder. And as a result of our constant defeat or what we feel like is our constant defeat of these sins as we struggle with these sins we begin to think God cannot use me God cannot work in my life I have sinned too bad and we falsely believe that our sin has disqualified us from being used by God now granted our sins can make it hard for God to use us, not because he can't do so, but because we quit listening. Because we build the barrier between him and us by, uncon by not having confessed sin. By, by re holding on to this sin and building a barrier between us and God, and he has a hard time talking to us, we have a hard time hearing him and being obedient. So this morning... We're going to go to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. 
And we're going to see that we have a God who stays with us even when we mess up. A God who does not abandon us, a God who does not discard us, but a God who stays. And this is a lesson that Peter had to learn. So in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, and when you find it, if you'll stand with me. John chapter 15, 21, beginning in verse 15. And said when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. And a second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. And he asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. And truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. And he said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this word today. We ask that you to glorify your name, honor your word. You've given it to us that we might learn from it, help us to do so this morning, that we might hear your voice in all of the, the voices of this world. Your voice will penetrate, that your voice will be clear, and that we will obediently walk in the way of the Lord. And ask this in that name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. So, you know the story. What we've just read is that story of, of Jesus reinstating Peter to his position as an apostle and as a minister of the gospel. That this event had to take place for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll talk about this morning. Um, but during that night in which Jesus was betrayed, Peter had made a foolish claim that he would not ever deny or turn his back on Jesus. And Jesus confronted him and said, Tonight you will deny me three times. Now before that rooster crows today, you are going to deny me three times. And what we find in Peter's denial is that sin comes to us when we are weak in our flesh. Now we know this because of what Matthew 26, 40 tells us. Uh, in Matthew 26, 40 and 41, Jesus is praying in the garden. He has finished, and he has come back to the apostles um, after his praying for the first time. And this is what he says. He says, then he returned to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watching me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, those final words, have they ever echoed in your brain as you have fallen into sin and you thought, man, the Spirit was willing to be obedient, but the flesh, my flesh is weak. And, and, and these words, they, they, they bounce around in the Christian's brain, they echo, and because it is the reality is that oftentimes we don't want to sin. We just don't want to. And then when the opportunity comes up, because we haven't been praying, because we haven't prepared ourselves against the temptation, we haven't guarded our hearts against it, boom, we fall into sin. The Spirit was willing to be obedient. The Spirit desired to be obedient, but the flesh was weak. And I, I'd be willing to say every one of us here this morning who is a Christian, we struggle with sin. We struggle with the reality that we serve a Savior whom we say we love, who has saved us by grace, whom we say we want to honor and glorify, and yet every day by our actions, we, we, we think, man, I'm a liar because I keep sinning. I, I walk in my path and not his path. And what we find is that this statement is true, that the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if we want to avoid sin, we have to do what Jesus told Peter, what Jesus told those apostles, watch and pray 
so that you will not fall into temptation. You see, the only way sin is defeated is when we watch and pray. What are we watching? We're watching Jesus Christ. We're watching what he does, what he's doing, how he's working, and where he's telling us to go. It's part of the watching process. And we're praying in order that we may be obedient to his word and not fall into that temptation. So as we watch him, he helps us overcome temptation and sin. As we watch him, what we're doing, we're positioning ourselves in a place to be near him. We are telling others that this is where we live. We are watching our Savior. We live where our Savior is. We are walking with our Savior. And, and that allows us to overcome temptation. Unfortunately, that night as they were in the garden, Peter was tired. So he went to sleep physically, and because he couldn't stay awake and pray and ask for God's guidance and, and protection, not only did he sleep physically, he went to sleep spiritually. And as a result, he fell in to the temptation. So we advance this narrative a little bit that we see of, of Jesus now is captured. Judas has shown up. He's kissed him. He's moved him into the the, uh, the soldiers have moved him up to Caiaphas' house where the high priest is. Peter is followed with John. Um, they're, they're there, but what we find is that Peter positions himself in a place that the sin, it is, it's obvious that he has separated himself from Christ, that he has distanced himself from Christ. If you know the story, what we find is that they arrest him, they bring him to Caiaphas' house, and then in John chapter 18, verses 15 to 16, we find this. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. This other disciple, by the way, was John. And because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. Now the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. So... After this exchange, Peter now has walked in with John. He has the opportunity to stay with John, to walk on up to, to where Caiaphas and the other priests are up there, uh, wherever this, this is sitting on, probably in some veranda. And he has the opportunity to walk with John and go stand by Jesus. But what we find Peter does as he walks in, and he doesn't stay with John, but instead he goes and starts warming himself by the fire. And this is where he is confronted by three different people about being a Galilean and being a part of the apostles of Christ. Now, he could have owned that when he walked in. He could have said, that's who I am. I'm going to identify with Jesus. And he could have walked right up with John, stood up there as Jesus was there. And they were having this conversation with Caiaphas, the high priest. And, and he could have been a part of that. But instead, Peter reveals his distance in his heart by his distance in his position away from Christ. You see, he positioned himself. And that position re revealed the betrayal, the denial that was already taking place in his heart. So that when the servant girl confronted him and he said, I don't know Jesus, and the next person says, hey, don't you part of that group? And he says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And then that third person comes up and says, aren't you one of his apostles? You are a Galilean. And the scripture tells us that he replies with an oath or a curse and denies his relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was then, immediately, that that rooster crowed. Now, maybe you've been in that position of Peter. You've sinned, and your rooster crowed. And you realized what you've done. You realized that you've messed up. Now, Peter, here's Peter. He's denied Jesus three times. He's in this courtyard. That rooster crows, and you can... You know the feeling that Peter had. Here he is, I don't know him, Ex expletive. And then the rooster crows, and that sinking feeling in your spirit, that, that empty feeling that you just messed up so bad that you don't know how you're going to recover. You don't know how it, it's going to be after this because you 
know that you crossed the line that you didn't want to cross. And you've got that sinking, empty, gut feeling of, oh boy. And then Peter does something else that we don't find in any place but Luke. It says that Peter looked at Christ. Luke 22, 61. He looked at Christ and it says, And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. That was Peter's Judas kiss. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Judas turned his back on Jesus. Jesus. He positioned himself away from Jesus. If you know and you remember at the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And they all begin going, who is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And then Judas says, is it me? And then Jesus responds to him, basically, it is basically it's you. And then he tells him to go and do what he needs to do. So Judas leaves. And as the rest of them um, finish the supper and they head toward the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus has this conversation that takes place between the, the upper room and the garden, Judas is getting the soldiers to betray Jesus. And you know the story after Jesus has prayed those three separate times, the last time with sweat, blood, sweat drops of blood coming from his brow. Judas shows up and kisses Jesus and seals his betrayal. See, we all, we all have our Judas kiss. We all have this sense of betrayal towards Christ when we sin. We all feel that conviction when we sin. And, and when we come to this point of sin, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond? When, we, when we're convicted of sin, our response is necessary. Our response is important. And there is a proper response to the conviction of sin. So some people, when they are confronted with their sin, you know what they do? They double down. Oh, what I did was necessary. What I did was legitimate. I had to do it this way. Even if it was wrong, it was the right thing to do. You ever heard anybody say something like that? Politicians? Hello? You know, they, they always excuse their their malfeasance. It, it seems very few people ever really want to confess their sin right off the bat, especially in the public life. So the proper response to sin is not to double down. Others may go, yes, I did that. I'm sorry. I, I repent of my sin, and yet there's no change in their lives. And really what it is is they're sorry they got caught, and they're not sorry about what they did. So there's no confession. There's no repentance. Uh, I think a lot of Christians are that way whenever God comes and convicts and we give lip service versus heart service to God. And then there are those when God shows up and says, hey, what you did I don't like. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we're truly broken. Now brokenness does not always look like weeping and crying and stuff. But the understanding that we have separated ourselves from God. Therefore, we confess our sin and we allow God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, to change our lives to reflect Him better than what we were. Now, when you and I fall into temptation, it is because the flesh is weak. It is because we have not guarded our heart. And therefore, we come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Judas and Peter give us two different pictures of what it looks like when conviction comes. Now, Judas, as we know, is really a non-believer, whereas Peter is a believer. But the lost come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit for their sin, just like the Christian does. So the response is what matters. The proper response um, is one way, and then you have the, the improper response, which is Judas's. So Judas's response is remorse without repentance. Judas finally realizes that he has condemned an innocent man to die. And he realizes that he did actually, I think he actually loved Jesus. He was just trying to force him into that, that uh, Messiah picture that Judas had and not that Jesus was presenting. And so when he realizes that he can, has condemned him, 
Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5 says this. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned to 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and to the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood, which reveals something about him. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility, which reveals something about the religious leaders, too. And we won't get into that. It says, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. So the conviction of sin, which was very evident in the words he has spoken, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is remorse without repentance. Now, it may sound like he repented. Oh, he told them that he did something wrong, but where do you go to get true forgiveness when you repent? You go to Jesus Christ. See, Judas did not go to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. Now, I realize Jesus was in prison at the moment and soon to be hung on the cross, but Judas could have bided his time. Judas could have realized that I have, I have sinned against Jesus, I, I need forgiveness, and I need to go to him and ask forgiveness. And when the opportunity presents itself, I'll do that. But instead, what Judas chose to do was allow his remorse to drive him into an immediate deep depression to the point that he committed suicide. That he took his own life. That he didn't bother to go and even ask God the Father for forgiveness. He would have received it there. He, but what he does is goes and kills himself. And the opportunity for forgiveness is lost. I truly believe that if Judas, and y'all heard me say this before, if Judas had gone to the foot of the cross and said, I'm sorry, forgive me, the scripture would be a little bit different in that we would have another saying of Jesus Christ telling Judas, you are forgiven. But that's not what happened. His response was remorse without repentance. And when there is unconfessed sin in our lives, it will drive us down, it will defeat us, it will bring us into a point of depression, so much so that we may even want to take our own lives. That is an improper response to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Peter's response in Luke chapter 22, verse 62, is remorse with repentance. When Jesus turns and looks at Peter, what Scripture tells us is that Peter immediately comes under conviction and he goes out into the darkness. He leaves the courtyard. He goes into the darkness of the city and it says that he wept bitterly. That he cried about his sin. He was broken over his sin. <clears throat> now, honestly, at the opportunity that he had when Jesus looked at him, he, he could have cried out for forgiveness right there. But as most of us do, when we sin, we'd rather go hide in the darkness and, and, and weep and, and be remorseful about it without asking forgiveness. Now, Peter gets to the point where I think he was ready to ask forgiveness. Now, has, after he has this ugly cry, this, that, where that sob, that heart-breaking cry that goes on, and, and, but Jesus is now going to be crucified. And Peter is so ashamed of himself that even after Christ is crucified, he doesn't go to the cross. He doesn't go and confess and, and ask for forgiveness. He is so ashamed that he hides himself away. And then Jesus dies. And I can imagine Peter's thoughts. I will never be able to receive forgiveness from Christ. I have betrayed. I have denied the one I love. And now he is gone. And then that third day arrives, that Sunday, and there's a beating on the door as, as Mary shows up and says, He's gone. His tomb is empty. And we scripture tells us that Peter and John get up and they run to the tomb. And that John stops and Peter goes on in to see. But you can tell that John believes a miracle has happened, but Peter does not. And somewhere between that time in Jesus appearing to the two men on the road to Emmaus, Scripture tells us in two different places that Jesus appeared to Peter. Now, 
what we find here is that we have a God who stays and restores. All of us sin against God. All of us have been Judas and Peter. It's a matter of what we do with the conviction that comes upon our lives. You see, when you sin, God does not just let you go. Scripture is very clear that you are in the hands of a holy, righteous, loving God. And Romans chapter 8 says that no one can remove you from the hands of God, including yourself. So once you're saved, you remain in the hands of God, even with all your sin and all your sorrow, all your shame, and so forth. So we are the ones who try to move away from God. But if he has us in his hand and won't let us go, how good are we going to be able to move away? We really aren't. It is going to be more of a heart position than a physical position. God is right here. Period. Who, who did he give you upon salvation? The Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Inside of us. So we cannot escape God, no matter how severe our sin, after salvation. Nothing we do after salvation makes the Holy Spirit go, dude, hands off. I'm gone. Nothing. He stays the whole time. So we might think, man, I did something horrible. I did the X, Y, Z. Take your pick of what they might be. Horrible sin. Maybe not so horrible, which it feels bad to you. And God stays. He doesn't flee. He doesn't let us flee. He remains with us the whole time. When Peter was convicted of his sin, he reacted properly in one sense. He had remorse with repentance. I think he went out. He wept bitterly. I even suspect, though it's not told in Scripture, that he probably asked God the Father for forgiveness. But in his heart, what he really knew is he needed Christ's forgiveness. So Jesus shows up. And I imagine that Peter's response to Jesus showing up after the crucifixion is to fall at the knees of Jesus and weep bitterly again. Confess what he has done and ask for forgiveness at the feet of Christ. And I believe that Christ gave it. And the reason I believe that is that what we read earlier in chapter 21 of John, verses 15 through 19. Because you see, when Jesus shows up here, Peter's response is not, I'm so sorry, and the, the, the ugly cry, the, you know, the whole snot running out of her nose and all that. But it's like, this has been dealt with. One thing has been dealt with, but the other part has not been dealt with. You see, we sin, <clears throat> and we feel like our sin has caused us to be unusable. God can't use me. Even though I've confessed it, even though I've gotten it right, God can't use me. I believe Peter felt that way, and that's why we have this interchange, this exchange here in John chapter 21, verse 15 and following. And what we find is that Jesus restores Peter with three questions. Do you love me? All three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? How many times did he betray him? I mean, deny him three times. So he restores him three times. Covers up those denials. Yet Jesus, I, I, I denied you, but I love you. I denied you, but he doesn't say it like that, but that's the implication. And so he restores Peter. Maybe Peter thought he was done, and why? that's why we find him fishing. You know, he, he's out on the boat. Now, uh, it could be just like a lot of guys, he just likes fishing. But it was his job. And they had gone out in order to catch fish. Jesus, I think, is confronting Peter's doubts concerning his qualifications to remain an apostle. Peter is probably thinking, well, I'm done. I'll let these other guys do the job, and I'll just move on. And Jesus is basically saying, you're not done. I'm not finished with you. I have a job for you. So he is restored to the apostolic um, position as well as recommissioned. And we see that with the statements, feed my sheep. 
the questions, do you love me, bring him into a, rest a restorative relationship with Christ as far as him being an apostle. And the statements, feed my sheep, bring him into that recommissioned position as an apostle. Now he has been recommissioned. You are still called to go forth, Peter. You are still called to go and, and deliver the message that I have given you. You are still called to go in and tell others about Jesus Christ. Your sin has not disqualified you from my service. And that's what Peter, I believe, thought. So with this brokenness and his newfound humility, which Peter absolutely needed, he is now going to be able to serve Christ better and from a correct position. Remember Peter throughout all three years of ministry, he's constantly sticking his foot in his mouth, right? And he even had the audacity at one time to tell Jesus what Jesus needed to do. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You see, Peter wanted to be in charge. And because Peter wanted to be in charge, it came to a point where Peter was in charge, and he denied Christ. And it broke him. It broke his spirit, and it broke his pride. So much so that on this side of the cross, on this side of the resurrection, Peter's not being arrogant, he's being humble. Instead of, why are you asking me these questions over and over, Jesus? We find, it says in verse 17, that when he asked him the third time, it says Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time. He was broken. He realized what Jesus was doing. One, two, three betrayals. One, two, three restorations. And it grieved him. It didn't make him mad like it might have before. It broke his heart. And then it revealed that he was ready to go into the world and do what God is calling him to do. In fact, we find a recommitment in verses 18 and 19 of even though it's Jesus speaking, his words indicate the position, the place of Peter's heart at this point. It says, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you're to go. And this is to indicate that Peter would be hung on a cross upside down. And that's how he would die. Peter, at this point, has recommitted his life to Christ. He has given it back. He's going to do what he's called to do. He's going to be obedient to the word of God. And perhaps you're here this morning and you think you've blown it for God so bad that he can't use you. Well, first, let me tell you, that is an incredibly arrogant statement. It is so arrogant, it, it, it flies in the face of Jesus and insults him greatly. Because what you are saying is that you and your sin are able to overcome the Son of God and His sacrifice. So let me be clear. Your sin, your issues, whatever it is that you have done cannot overcome the sacrifice and the work of Jesus Christ in the, through the cross of Calvary. It will and can defeat anything in your life. I don't care how bad it is. Okay. You take the worst sin that you can imagine, he can defeat it in your life. And he can use you in some way. The consequences of our sin might be that we're relegated to a certain type of usage. That's his business. But the reality is our sin cannot overcome his sacrifice. It cannot overcome his work. He will do what he needs to do. To bring us into the fold. Every Christian has been given a gift or a talent by the Holy Spirit as they came into the, 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 the fold. And that gift, that talent is to be used in the church. Whatever God has given you, you need to use in the church. This building, as well as in the world, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't given so we could just sit and uh, think about it, want to use it, but never do it. It was with the intent that God would be glorified. So today, as we think about the revival this week and we think about the work God is doing and the conviction of our spirits right now, if, it, if, it's, if you're under conviction, 
You have to choose how you're going to be defined. Am I going to be defined by my sin? Am I going to let my sin run my life? Am I going to let my sin let me be out in the community and there goes so-and-so known by his sin? The drunk, the, the adulterer, the whatever, take your pick. Or am I going to let myself be defined by what Calvary did for me? What the cross did? See, there's three crosses, right? And upon the cross in the middle was Jesus dying for, for, for all of mankind. And that's the cross of redemption. The cross of redemption. And on one side you have the thief who says, I did my bad stuff. I, I did the stuff I shouldn't have done. And I'm going to confess my, my, my sins and I'm going to ask Jesus to forgive me. And that is the cross of reception. The thief receives salvation on the cross. <laughs> that's, that's always been so cool to me. And he is told that you will be with me in paradise. But on the other cross is, a, is the, the thief who says, no, thank you. And that's the cross of rejection. And even as Christians, we still have to deal with both these crosses. Either we will receive the word that we're receiving from God through the Holy Spirit or we were rejected. doesn't mean we get lost. It doesn't mean we're not saved anymore. But it means that we're in disobedience. And we will deal with these crosses the rest of our lives. I have been saved by grace. Now will I receive the word or reject the word that God is calling me to follow? That is where revival takes place. When we receive the word and we let our lives be changed for his glory let's pray father we thank you for this word this morning we ask that you to speak to us from it may we honor and glorify you and all that has been said and done may you be lifted up and made known father we ask that you just convict our hearts move in a manner which we cannot understand or fully grasp but father that whatever it is that you are doing in our life whatever sin you are calling us to confess whatever conviction we are facing, may you do so in such a manner that we are re responsive. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace. In the name of Christ, we pray.